All right, it's Friday, January 14th. How is it already January 14th? We're halfway done the month of January. What? Hey, you know that this show is proudly presented by the team at Bitcoin Well, and I wanted to take a second to remind you, you know, a decent amount of our audience, a decent number of our audience members are from Calgary. And so a big shout out to Bitcoin Well. They've got their brand new Calgary office now open right downtown on 11th Avenue, 7th Street Southwest. You can go visit them in person. The team's available to sit down with you uh, one-on-one to answer all of your questions or help you make your very first Bitcoin purchase. You can find them online. Just check out the Sponsors tab on our website, ryanjesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Well, thank you very much, Carrie Ann. Coming up in just about 10 minutes, uh, I'm very much looking forward to a conversation. We're getting into a conversation on woke media. Yeah, that's right. What 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 is woke media doing to wreck democracy? Uh, I'm looking forward to the, the author of Bad News joining us, Bacha Ungar Sargon, uh, the author of Bad News. Uh, uh, why is or how is woke media wrecking democracy? I think this is going to be a great conversation. And then as promised earlier this week, our Friday tradition, that is the Real Talk Roundtable today. We're dedicating it to that story out of the United States. A super exciting story. I mean, it's going to be really, 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 really exciting if we're able to report on this with, with the enthusiasm that I have right now, months from now, if the recipient of this pig heart survives and you're going to go, well, that's kind of a weird way to frame it. I mean, he's right here. He can he can hear it. I mean, he's not with us on the show, but like the guy, you know, everybody's talking about whether or not he's going to live. That's kind of a weird thing. You know, talk to people that are fighting cancer or, or fighting like late stage disease and start talking openly about whether or not they're going to survive. These as, as human beings, we keep these conversations close to our chest. We don't talk about whether or not someone's going to survive. But that's the case here because this fella, not even yet 60 years old, is the first Recipient. This is the first time that American transplant surgeons have tried to drop a pig's heart into a human's chest to see if it'll work long term. And they're being frank about it. They're saying, listen, we don't know if this is going to take so far. It looks like it's taking. This is a really exciting story. And so we're going to talk to uh, cardiologist Dr. Lori West. Dr. Michael Van Nannen is going to join us as well, a bioethicist. I want to get into the cool science angle of why this story is really so neat and so exciting, but then also the ethical angles of it. And no question is totally out of bounds. So we want to encourage you, if you're going to be watching us live right now, if you're streaming us on the Mixler audio app or tuning in on YouTube, you can drop a question, a suggested question into the live chat there. You can also hit us up on Twitter uh, using, of course, our hashtag RealTalkRJ. That's powered by the team at Park Power. And right now, I want to remind you, this is the time of year, of course, especially if you're living in a cold climate. You've been making your way through a cold snap and, and you're just waiting. You're waiting for your first utility bill of the cold snap to show up in your mailbox and you know you're about to take a pummeling. You know that that bill is going to be higher than it has been all year. This is a great time to remind you that Park Power has different options for you. They've got fixed rate, variable rates, so you can find the plan that works best for you. When it comes to your electricity, your internet, and your natural gas, you can sign over right now. They do all the work for you to bring your business over to Park Power online at parkpower.ca. Also, big shout out to our friends at Kubi Energy. Park Power and Kubi Energy actually work together. Kubi's been providing solar energy solutions for a while now across Western Canada based out of Edmonton and Kamloops, BC. They've got a great arrangement where if your solar setup, whether it's residential, commercial, industrial, or otherwise, is it's creating surplus power, you can sell it back to the grid in a way that benefits you and, of course, benefits everybody else as well. Jake and his team ready to provide a free quote right now, regardless of how big your solar or sustainable energy goals are. You can find them online at kubienergy.ca. And of course, a mention as well for our friends at Athabasca University. We want to remind you that at this time of year, it's it's the time that we're a few weeks into January and you're still perhaps looking for a way to make good on your, do I dare use the word resolution, your plan this year to better yourself, your plan to broaden your skill set or perhaps make yourself better positioned for what could be a really competitive job market once we start to emerge out of this. How's the job market 
changing? Where are trends going? If you're looking for insight, Canada's online university is where you want to go. You'll find them online right now at AthabascaU.ca. Well, we've got a lot of stories to cover today. Sarah Hoyle's got her eye on the news. And of course, we're going to get to some of those stories making news, including what they're doing in Spain right now. I love this story. We'll get to it after my conversation with our lead off guest this morning. But Spain, uh, they're implementing new legislation that would name pets actual members of the family. Now, if anybody with a pet, you're going to go, well, yeah, tell us something we don't know, obviously. But that's not how pets have been treated in legal decisions in past. For example, when a family, when a marriage breaks up, What happens to the pet? They're typically treated like property. How will it change it to name a pet a member of the family? I know every single one of you. I think I can say with confidence, literally every single one of you with a pet will go, well, obviously they're members of the family, but what are the implications? That's what we'll get into. But first, woke media. You hear it a lot. People are using the phrase, but what is it? What qualifies media as woke? And is it really wrecking democracy? If so, how? I'm really eager to get into this with our next guest. Batya Ungar Sargon is the deputy opinion editor of Newsweek. She's also the author of Bad News, How Woke Media is Undermining Democracy. Batya, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to Real Talk. Thanks for making time for us and a good morning to you. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure. Where are you coming to us from today? Where are you? You're on the East Coast? Yes, I am in Brooklyn, New York. Brooklyn, New York. How are things in New York? I always like to sort of like try to get our finger on the pulse of where our guests are chiming in from right now um, with regards to the New York and, and the state of COVID and where everybody's at right now and the masks and the infections and the hospitalizations. What's your assessment of where your home state is right now? You know, it's so funny because uh, we saw a really interesting thing happen, which was for much of the pandemic, you had liberals really sort of having this point of view about getting COVID as though it was some sort of moral failing, right? It was like, mask up, get the vax. And anybody who was refusing to do that got equated with anyone who got the, you know, COVID. And there was this almost smugness about people who were able to stay home, who had the economic privilege to work from home, right? Who are, you know, oh, I've never had COVID. I've never had COVID. And what we're seeing with Omicron now is that, you know, the vaccine is not very effective at preventing it. And so a lot of these same liberals Liberals who are so high on their own virtue of being able to stay home and not get COVID are getting it. And it's really shifting the discourse in a very interesting way. Hopefully, we'll be able to have much more unity and much less divisiveness over really tackling this awful disease. Oh, man. I, you know what? And I've been, I've been sort of trying to wrap my mind around this, I think, both on the air and off the air, trying to mm-hmm. reconcile how different everyone's attitudes seem to be with regards to the pandemic right now and Omicron. I don't mind at all that you made it political or you started introducing perspectives across the political spectrum with your perception of what liberals have been doing here, because you know what? Honestly, I mean, you could really make observations about the social uh, or or the sort of interpersonal elements of COVID-19 and of this pandemic over the past couple of years, can't you? And 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 the, the attitudes that people have changed, people that have done everything and taken every single step to avoid it for two years now, I'm seeing some of them with my own eyes. These are my anecdotal observations. Some people saying, wow, we might as well just get it now and get it over with. I'm going, well, hang on a second. Wait a I second. I, I don't know. know how to figure it out. I know. Where were you before one in five American businesses was forced to shut down because you forced people to stay home? Where were you when essential workers were going out day in and day out and you were treating them like they were lepers and refusing to touch them because they were getting exposed to it and you were ensconced safely in your home? Where were you when children, black children, poor children, children were experiencing massive learning loss and getting further pushed behind their elite white counterparts, right? Because you closed their schools. Like where were all of these people back when conservatives were saying all this? And I say this as a lefty, I'm not a conservative, but that sort of the hypocrisy now, the memory holding of the way that we treated the less fortunate is so disgusting. And I don't know what it's like in Canada, but in America over the last two years, we oversaw the single largest transfer of wealth wealth from the bottom and the middle classes to the elites and to wealthy corporations and to billionaires that we have ever had in the United States ever. It is absolutely disgusting. And to see them just memory hole all of that because now they're getting it. It's really, really terrible. 
So have you had, um, and, and by the way, first of all, just for our audience's benefit, I want to let them know that I really, I, these are my favorite kind of interviews because I came into this. I know you won't be insulted by this. This is a compliment. I came into this with no plan. I had my first <laughs> question, which is what qualifies media as woke. And then I just want to dance with you for like 20 <laughs> minutes. And so I, I'm excited. I know you're up for it. I've watched other interviews you've done. Um, have you been like since the outset here? I mean, since let's call it February, March of 2020, if we can look back a couple of years, were you inherently and automatically opposed to some of the measures that you were seeing rolled out or did it take time for you? So I see everything through a class lens and immediately it became clear that the what Carol Markowitz calls the pajama class, the people who could with white collar jobs, who could afford to stay home and do their jobs in front of their keyboards right from their homes, were going to be able to protect themselves because they were going to be able to rely on the labor of the working classes to bring them their food, right? To drop it off in front of their homes, uh, to deliver their Amazon packages, right? And so instantly it became clear to me that what we were essentially doing was taking something that was a class question of privilege and overlaying onto that some kind of virtuousness, essentially criminalizing being poor. This was what the left was doing, what liberals were doing. That is the kind of thing that makes me nauseous. That's what woke media is, by the way, to answer the first question you wanted to start with, you know, wokeness to me is a smokescreen for class. It's when highly educated, very affluent liberals use race and a moral panic around race, not real racism that we need to fight, but a moral panic about microaggressions, things that are not actually happening in order to distract from a class divide in America that has benefited liberals. That's what woke media does. Do you think do people have a hard time pinning you down uh, on a spectrum trying to figure you out or pigeonhole you? Because I know people are going to be listening right now going, hang on, you're, you're bringing on a guest that immediately is starting to criticize lockdown measures. She's using the phrase woke and she claims to be a lefty. This doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> that is my favorite question to answer. I'm a left wing populist, but I frequently have people say these are conservative talking points. You're just a conservative. And I say to them, hmm. All I talk about is inequality. All I talk about is class. Are you trying to tell me now that it is the left's position that talking about inequality and class is a conservative right wing concern? Is that where we're at? Because that's not you attacking somebody else. That's a self own, right? That's you seeding the most important question of the day, the disgusting income inequality in America. And you're saying that's now a conservative proposition. If that's true, sure, call me a conservative. If being a Marxist is now being a conservative, sure, you know? I don't care, <laughs> man. I don't even know. If, I mean, it's it's unbelievable right now. And, and I wish that we were, you know, it's probably up to people like me and maybe even you as well to interview more World War Two veterans about how they feel about people using. I mean, people are talking about fascists and Nazis and people are using wow. invoking a lot of these phrases right now that I think have kind of like I think it's safe to say lost their meaning if we're invoking those right now. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with you. I think questions of left and right are no longer really applicable. It's really a question of powerful versus powerless. And what we mm. see in America is you have elites using the idea of polarization to drum up their own actually, you know, to line their pockets and get power, that's the top 10% is doing that. 90% of Americans are much more united than divided. They are completely beyond polarization. They don't care at all because they simply are too working too hard to feed their families. And so what you have is actually a lot of class solidarity at the bottom and class solidarity among the elites, which expresses itself in this pantomime of polarization, like Mama, I'm the left, you're the right, oh, Democrats, Republicans, blah, 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 when actually they are consolidating power at record levels. I mean, record levels. Liberals, affluent, highly educated liberals are so far above even middle-class Americans at this point that, you know, there was been just this middle class squeeze that has actually benefited a lot of very highly educated people in knowledge industry jobs who 20 years ago, 30 years ago, lived in working class neighborhoods and didn't make that much more than their working class neighbors. Let me let me ask you, and I, I want to get into the premise of your book, and, and, yeah. I, and I'm really eager to hear your assessment of the state of journalism 
Yeah. Right now, if you take a look at where public trust is at with journalism, it's at a crisis point. There's no way to ignore it. Um, and I think a big part of that has to do with some of the reporting and, and, and as well as some of the op ed type opinion stuff that we see on cable news like Fox, like CNN and other outlets here. Do, you know, when you talk about woke media, I mean, even the word media uh, covers a lot of ground here. Is, is this your indictment of journalism? Are you talking about digital information platforms? Uh, let's get into who you're taking a look at. Okay, great. So my book is a history of populist journalism in America, which is how it started. American journalism began by, uh, by, by working class people who were creating no journalism, information, knowledge for other working class people. It started as a populist revolution whose job was to give power to the people. That was the job of the fourth estate. Over the course of the 20th century, journalism went from being a working class trade, a job that you did not go to college to do, a pretty low status job one by, done by working class people who were outside of power, who were demanding accountability on behalf of other people who were working class and outside of power. It underwent a status revolution to where journalists today in America, 92% of them have a college degree, even though you do not need college to become a journalist. The majority of them have a graduate degree, which is essentially a vanity degree, a $70,000 in US dollars, <laughs> vanity degree that you do not need in order to be a journalist. And it's become this tightly, tightly concentrated cast. They're now in the top 10% in terms of income. They marry each other. They live next door to corporate lawyers, make a little bit less than them. You know, it's become become one of the sectors in the American elites. And I argue in my book that as journalists went from being working class to being part of the elites, they abandoned the working class, they abandoned their cause. And that's why we've seen over the last 30, 40 years, so have the Democrats. I mean, when the journalism class abandoned the working class, they signaled to politicians, essentially, you can ship these people's jobs overseas, you can ship them to China and build up China's middle class, you know, and we will not say a word about it. And I argue that the woke revolution, the obsession with race, the obsession with gender, that this is the latest stage of an elite class abandoning class issues, abandoning the working class, abandoning the huge question of inequality in America because they have benefited from it. They don't want to talk about the class divide because they ended up on top. We're talking to Dr. Batcha Ungar Sargon, uh, author of Bad News, How Woke Media is Undermining Democracy. I do. I will push back on on the media and the earning power of media. I don't know if you're, if you're talking about Tucker Carlson or if you're talking about Don Lemon or some of these personalities, Wolf Blitzer, maybe. Um, I think that when you talk about everyday average journalists, they're making less now and doing more work than they ever have before. So it'd be interesting to be able to differentiate between those two. It's, it's you earn your Ph.D. from UCAL Berkeley. Uh, you're in your doctorate in the state of California. You're working now in the state of New York. These aren't exactly right wing <laughs> strongholds. How does your uh, indictment of news media, the woke media right now, how does that play in, in Cali, New York and, and other blue states? <laughs> well, if you allow me to push back a little bit on your push sure, back just do. for a second. But um, so it's true that the um, the the opening salary for a journalism job is something like thirty five thousand dollars. Right. Mm -hmm. Very, very little especially when you think about the fact that 75% of new journalism jobs are in the coast in the most expensive American cities, you know, New York City, Seattle, San Francisco, Washington, DC, right? You literally cannot live on $35,000 in any of those cities. What does that mean though? That doesn't mean that journalists are making less than ever before. It means that only rich kids can become journalists, right? Because somebody else has to pay your rent and it's usually their affluent parents. So you start with this very low, low salary, but because the industry is so tiny now, we've lost about two thirds of journalism jobs over the last 20 years, um, by the time you make it to your 40s or 50s, you're in the top 10% in terms of earning potential, you're making over $100,000 if you can stick if you can stick it out, right, if you can have that support from a family member to do it. As for how this plays, you know, look, I have been very gratified that despite the fact that some people will say, oh, these are conservative talking points, my book has been understood as a left wing critique of liberalism and of the left today of the people who call themselves socialists. And then their number one issue is 
$50,000 in student loan debts. I mean, who has $50,000 in student loans? It's not the working class, right? Mm. You know, so I, I, it has been understood as a left-wing critique that, of course, you know, conservatives are very eager to read, especially given the fact that it's Republicans now who have that populist economic energy, much more so than the liberals in America, just because that was actually Donald Trump's legacy. I mean, People don't want to talk about this, but it was. Um, so I would say that it has been understood in the spirit in which I wrote it. And I, I, I feel deeply grateful uh, to, 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 to my fellow lefties for understanding it in that manner, by and large. This is it's interesting. I mean, to use your words, the media's obsession, you say, with race or gender. I mean, to a certain degree, I think coverage reflects where society's at, where movements have been at. I mean, obviously, George Floyd's murder uh, certainly, you know, prompted a, a resurgence of that Black Lives Matter movement, which we saw around the world. The gender conversation, an interesting one for you to bring up. I think it'd be interesting for our audience to know that before you joined Newsweek, you were the opinion editor of The Forward, uh, which is the largest, Jew the largest Jewish media outlet in America. I would imagine you have opinions probably on some media conversations <laughs> and stances that are taken on Palestine, right? I mean, yeah, we're just doing small talk today, you know, you and me, Batcha. Um, but uh but, no I mean, big issues at all. Nothing no, no big issues here. at all. So so we'll just breeze past all those. But in all seriousness, I mean, these are the big, big issues yeah. that are impacting Americans, that are impacting people around the world. The media's obsession with race. I mean, isn't media reflecting what it's seen going on around it? I love that question. L let me put some meat on this and a little bit of data so people don't think that I'm just sitting here being like, mama, woke media. Ah, there's actually numbers to back this up. My book began by looking at what sociologists have called the great awakening. And what they're talking about there is not the fact that Republicans have been on the forefront of criminal justice reform for the last decade, which is a fact that people on the left don't like to encounter. That's not woke. You know, when Donald Trump released 5,000 black men from prison with the First Step Act, he wasn't being woke. He was just being a good American. The Great Awakening reflects something that happened in 2015, where sociologists started to notice that white liberals had opinions about race that were further to the extreme than blacks and Latinos. OK, white liberals started to talk about race in a very academic way in, that was much more radical than the way that Blacks and Latinos speak about race and think about race, right, who they're allegedly advocating on behalf of. So that happened in 2015. But I would dispute what you're saying, that the media is reflecting public opinion. I think it's the opposite based on these same sociologists work, because what they found was in 2011, 2012, you started to see the absolute skyrocketing of woke terms in the mainstream liberal news. So the New York Times, the Washington Post, NPR, the Atlantic, CNN, MSNBC, they started to use words like white privilege, oppression, marginalization, people of color next to words like oppression and marginalization with just skyrocketing frequency. They literally trawled the archives and collected quantitative data about how many times they use these words. And so up until 2011, it was kind of like this, and then it went like this, and we're still in that ski slope. So, so this happened in 2011, 2012, and here in 2015, public opinion among white liberals, affluent white liberals who are the target audience of these news outlets started to reflect what their news media had, start, had been telling them. That's what I mean by the great awakening and woke media, a media that is obsessed with race, not the way that blacks and Latinos talk about race, not obsessed with actual police reform that we desperately need, but obsessed with talking about it in a very academic way that divides the world into powerful and powerless white people versus people of color. And I'll just make one final point, which is that, you know, this great awakening, you know, the, the, the way that it shifted public opinion, it's not just that journalists are increasingly highly educated, increasingly come from places, you know, universities where they're teaching them this critical race theory and they're bringing it into newsrooms with them. It's that it happened exactly when we've started to go digital. You know, the pressures of digital media really reinforced this use of this language because it was a way of catering to a highly educated, very affluent white audience. That's what they wanted to read, but they reflect maybe 6% of Americans. So it was the narrowing of the scope of journalism to cater to rich white people. 
And it actually reflects that abandonment of the working class, including the working class people of color, black working class people, Latino working class people who don't think of themselves as oppressed. They think of themselves as working class people who need a multiracial working class coalition to help elevate their fortunes and have real economic mobility for their children, which nobody wants to talk about on the left, actually. So they talk about this stuff instead. Batcha, I'm going to circle back because I, I have to figure out how a lefty can assess <laughs> Donald Trump's performance in the Oval Office as acting as a good American. I'll do that in a second, but I'm, I'm, I'm particularly interested in your quick fix or at least your I mean, if you're if you're if you're brought in to fix this, if you you're brought in as the CEO of, of American media and, uh, and and your job is to determine how media can get back on track, get back to its roots and straighten itself out. Where would you start and what would the plan look like? So there's the, there's a consumer fix and then an industry fix. The consumer fix is stop reading the news. You don't need to know anything they're telling you. It is all nonsense. Go back to synagogue, go back to church, go volunteer, go hang out with people in your community who you disagree with. We have replaced community and spirituality with knowledge and information. And it is, it's, it's messing us up. Like we don't need to know any of this mass consumer boycott is the number one thing. And you're seeing that CNN has lost 90% of its viewership, right? We're seeing that mass consumer boycott. So, so that's from the consumer point of view, from the industry point of view, if I were put in charge, I, I mean, I am in charge of, you know, a little piece of an opinion section at Newsweek. And what I'm doing there is trying to count counteract all of this by running working class voices. I Every week I have people who are work at McDonald's, truck drivers, people who are linemen, people who are construction workers telling us what America looks like to them. That's the number one fix is get rid of all of these Harvard, Princeton educated people and go back into real America and give those people a voice and stop calling them racist because they voted for somebody that you don't like. I'm curious to know uh, the role that you think that uh, number 45 played in this. I mean, you, yeah. you referenced Donald Trump and, and obviously, I mean, you know, you, you may come at this as a Democrat or a Republican and offer a scathing indictment or praise for Donald Trump as, as president. My feelings on the Trump presidency are pretty clear. But if, if you take a look at the state of cable news before CNN would take big swipes at, for example, George W. Bush, I'll pick a Republican president. Uh, Fox would take big swipes at Bill Clinton or, or other Democrats. But it was never, never like it was when Donald Trump held office. Then you take a look at the impact that he had on social media being deplatformed by Twitter and others. Now he's starting his own services. I mean, Donald Trump was an is a huge player in that evolving media and communications landscape. How do you assess the role that he played in that? And what does that look like moving forward? There's no way I don't think that Donald Trump disappears forever. I think he's licking his wounds right now. He'll be back. He will be back. But I have to say, like speaking to a lot of his you know, supporters, people who really like what he did, a lot of them feel that his moment has sort of passed. Um, his, you know, ironically, his massive support for the vaccine that he uh, fast tracked is going to be a wedge issue for a lot of people on the right. I mean, he's acting um, like he developed it. Well, he, you know, Operation Warp Speed, you know, does have his, you know, he he really did do that. That was him. You know, he. this is the problem. It's like, yeah, he did a lot of bad stuff. He was very gross. He spent a lot of time brawling with people. He was very undignified. He couldn't keep his mouth shut. He said racist things. He said anti-Semitic things. But he did a lot of really good things for our country. From an economic populist point of view, he did everything Bernie Sanders promised he was going to do in 2015. In 2015, Bernie Sanders was out there railing against NAFTA. Trump got rid of it. He was out there saying we need a trade war with China. Trump started it. He was out there saying we need tariffs on foreign goods. We've got tar tariffs on foreign goods. You know, the, the bottom 25% of wage earners saw a 4.5% wage increase under Trump. He, they were seeing that money coming into their pocketbooks at the end of the day. And of the hundreds and hundreds of Trump voters that I interviewed personally, Every single one of them, except for one, said to me, I wish he would just shut up and govern. I hate the brawling. It's so undignified, but I love what he's doing for this country. And I think it's very hard because people don't even know this stuff because there was a taboo on it because the Republicans are addicted to this trickle down free market nonsense. So they didn't want to talk up all of his protectionist socialist policies and the lefties who were supposed to be on the side of this kind of thing. They couldn't say anything nice about him. So nobody knows about this except people who were quiet 
quietly seeing the money coming in, except businesses who were quietly seeing that things were suddenly a little bit easier. So yeah, it's hard to say nice things about somebody who's so offensive to our, you know, aesthetic sensibilities. But at the same time, I mean, there, there was just a lot of good. And I think people are now realizing that at the same time, I don't think that he Look, you know, prognostication is a fool's a fool's uh, a fool's errand. But um, you know, I I don't know that we're necessarily going to see you know Donald Trump on the ticket in twenty twenty four. We'll see, I guess. Batya, I will run fool's errands all day long. It just, <laughs> I don't preclude myself from running fool's errands. <laughs> let me ask you. Let me ask you. I mean, and 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 it's also worth pointing out. I mean, I yeah, I think Donald Trump was a total disaster. I've also had a lot of conversations with people that are echoing the exact points that you're making right now, saying that there were a lot of things that he did that were really beneficial for American manufacturers and businesses and entrepreneurs and investors. Um, you take a look at the, the results that saw Joe Biden take the White House back for the Democrats. It's not like Trump had six million votes. He still had 70 million votes. I mean, the, the, the nation was essentially almost the only divided group that he lost ground with were white men. Like he gained ground with LGBTQ people. He got 35% of Muslims. He got 40% of Latinos. He got 20% of black men. I mean, who heard of such a thing? And yet we're supposed to believe that every person who voted for him is a white supremacist. I mean, well, I, I think it, it just goes to show also that a lot of times when people are deciding who they're going to vote for, they're not going based on that person's moral fabric or ethical performance. They're going on what's best for them. And to a certain degree, I guess you could probably make the argument of what's wrong with that. Uh, let me ask you in closing, uh, respect your time. I know you've got a big plan today. So do we, but I, I've got to ask you about your state. I don't know if, were you reborn and raised in New York? Are you, are you like a New Yorker or is it where you're living right oh, now? No, no, I, I, uh, I've only been here for about 10 years. Been here for 10 years. So, I mean, New York's obviously a huge player um, when it, when it comes to, you know, the American fabric, when it comes to the politics, former president Donald Trump from New York state, obviously um, you, you've got the uh, farmer governor Cuomo. What a disaster that was over the past year. Uh, new York city's got a new mayor in, in Eric Adams. There's, there's a lot going on in the state of New York and, and the rest of the nation is kind of paying close attention to it. What does 2022 look like when it comes to the politics out of New York state? So what you're seeing now is a class divide between a working class, mostly people of color who voted for Eric Adams and support his sort of a little bit more tough on crime point of view because crime is rampant in poor communities in New York. And then you're seeing a highly educated, high on its own virtue, liberal elite who just voted in a DA who is refusing to prosecute uh, the majority of crimes. So we're going to see that class divide within the, the Democratic Party, within the Democratic coalition, hopefully coming to a head and hopefully the working class and Eric Adams, their tribune is going to win because the victims of all the crimes that that DA is not prosecuting are people of color, are black people. Black people are being murdered and shot and carjacked and robbed. Children old people, I mean, and, and, and white liberals are sitting in, you know, on the Upper East Side, you know, voting in people who are not going to protect these people in knowing in the safety of their communities that they're never going to have to deal with this stuff. It's disgusting. And I really, really hope that Eric Adams puts them where they belong. Dr. Batcha Ungar Sargon is uh, the, <laughs> you should just laugh when I'm wrapping the interview. I love, you got to come back. You have to come back. What we have Anytime. to do is get you on a panel. We've got to get I, I, I would just love to see you trade punches. Uh, your book, Bad News, How Woke Media is Undermining Democracy. Uh, you've also probably read Batcha's work in The Washington Post, New York Times, Foreign Policy, Newsweek, The New York Review of Books Daily and other publications seen her on NBC and MSNBC and NPR. And you've done it all now you can add real talk to the list batcha it's been a pleasure to connect thanks for doing the show oh man ryan thank you so much for having me this is so fun yeah i agree i really appreciate it i love conversations like this uh real talk is you let us know what you think about what you just heard i dropped in on the live chat and i saw some of you being like i can't figure her out i'm trying to figure her out i can't figure her out that to me uh, makes for great guest material. And of course, you can make sure you check out her book, Bad News, How Woke Media is Undermining Democracy. Coming up in a few minutes, we'll get to our Friday roundtable conversation. I will look into the science and the ethics of pig heart or pig organ transplants into humans. And you may say, well, what are the ethics on this? If it works, let's do it. It's saving people's lives. Yeah, sure. But we don't want to assume that we have the answers to all the questions. I'm looking forward to getting into this with a couple of expert voices that coming up in just a moment. Let me remind you right now that the teams at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge right now have their inventory all listed online. If you're in the market for perhaps a minivan, 
You're looking for an SUV. You want to add four-wheel drive to the mix for your family, maybe for the first time ever. You're going to want to take a look at the Jeep lineup this year, including that new seven-passenger Wagoneer that everybody's buzzing about. And then, of course, if your family is looking to maybe be pulling something this summer, whether it's a holiday trailer, a boat, or something else, everybody trusts the Ram lineup, including that Ram 1500 back-to-back-to-back winner of Motor Trends Truck of the Year. You'll find the best selection in the province online and in person at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge. Our friends at Eden Landscaping want to remind you that even though you may not be thinking about your garden, you may not be thinking about your vegetable planter boxes right now or perhaps how that cherry tree is going to look in the backyard. Now's the time to start talking to your landscape designer about putting the wheels in motion. You want to make sure that you're not left waiting for the supply chain to get your construction materials here. You want your team working on it now. That means it's a great time to get in touch with Eden Landscaping. You can find Mike and his team online at landscapeedmonton.ca, including browsing their portfolio. Get a sense of exactly what they do so well and why they've earned the return business of so many customers over the last 20 years. You know, we feed our dogs Grand Dog Essentials quality raw food, and I recommend that you look into it as well. Of course, they're not going to tell you that it's automatically going to be the best plan for your dog, but what they can do is give you the nutritional advice if you're looking to improve your dog's health. Maybe it's even just the shine of their coat. Maybe it's a gut issue that you can't help, but it, you know, you're taking a look at it right now. You're trying to ignore it, but this is a family member for Pete's sake. You want to make sure that they have the quality raw food and the supplements they need to live a full and healthy life. You can find them online at granddog.ca. The promo code REALTALK gets you 10% off your first time order. And don't forget, they deliver directly to your door if you're tuning in from Calgary, Edmonton, or across central Alberta. Well, this is a story that made news, I mean, obviously around the world as American surgeons successfully transplanted a pig's heart into the chest of a man, uh, a relatively young man under the age of 60. And according to all reports right now, the heart is functioning well. Uh, The recipient's name is Dave Bennett. And he says, listen, he says this heart is still a rock star. As a matter of fact, Dr. Bartley Griffith, who led that transplant team at the University of Maryland's Medical Center, says the heart seems to be reasonably happy in its new host. It has more than exceeded our expectations. Uh, Dave Bennett, who's got the pig's heart beating in his chest right now, 57 years of age, he's now off the machine. This was a machine that kept blood circulating through his body for more than a month and a half, 45 days, including several days after the surgery. He's breathing on his own and he's speaking. They say, albeit with a quiet voice, but he's speaking and able to communicate with others. We wanted to take a closer look at this. I mean, when it comes to the significance of this, is this a one-off? Is this a really cool story that may work for one person? Or could this forever change transplant science and options that are available to people living with heart disease or other potential looming organ failures? And what are the ethical angles on this as well? Dr. Lori West is the director of the Canadian Donation and Transplantation Research Program. She also heads up the Alberta Transplant Institute. Uh, I'm going to congratulate her once we can see her face. But Dr. West was also just named an officer of the Order of Canada back in December for her leadership in the field of organ transplantation and donation. Uh, Joining Dr. West is Dr. Michael Von Manen. Uh, He's the director of the John Dossler Health Ethics Center, also an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Alberta. Uh, Dr. Van Manen uh, also has a clinical practice as a physician in neonatal perinatal medicine at the Stollery Children's Hospital. Dr. West, Dr. Van Man, and it's a real pleasure to have the both of you with us. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, Dr. West, let me lead off with a, a congratulations to you, an officer of the Order of Canada, for your work when it comes to organ transplantation and donation. That's obviously got to mean a lot to you. Thank you very much, Ryan. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, yes, it was quite a surprise when, uh, when uh, the phone call came from the Governor General's office. Uh, it's not something you ever expect to hear. So it was just really quite a wonderful surprise. You know, I, I remember obviously a great, a great, great honor. Yeah. And, and you joined this list, you, you, you joined this, this group, this list of Canadians that have, uh, you know, made significant impacts in their communities and bettered the lives of other Canadians and certainly made 
the country proud when it comes to the field of organ donation and in particular transplantation over the course of your career how dramatic has been the increase in what we understand about this science and how it applies to literally saving people's lives yeah it's uh there was there the idea of using organs um, to replace a failing organ, of course, it's been around for a long time. And it's only just in the late 1950s that the first really successful organ transplant was carried out, a, a kidney transplant between identical twins, setting the stage for show, you know, showing definitively that the surgical maneuver to transplant one organ in, from one human to another worked, but the immunologic uh, barriers then became the predominant ones. But um, over the last um, more than 50 years now, since that case, uh, overcoming those immune barriers, um, not only between individuals, but if you look at the, the even bigger barriers between species um, has really driven um, uh, progress in, in, in organ transplantation and understanding the need because there are so many people in need of transplants. Dr. Van Manen, uh, I, I want to get into some of the specifics of this story out of Maryland and, and with this transplant, but uh, you know, more generally speaking, uh, I'd love to have you pick up on what Dr. West was talking about um, with regards to the leaps and bounds that have been taken forward. This story out of Maryland, how significant is it with regards to the bigger picture? You know, Somebody that's watching right now from Sudbury, Ontario or Abbotsford, BC that has heart disease that's going, I wonder if a year or two years or three years from now that might be me? That's a really good question, Ryan. And whenever it comes to talking about a medical innovation, we always want to ask, to what extent is this something actually new or different from what was in practice before? Um, I think it needs to be acknowledged that when it comes to using animal tissues in, in medicine and for research, this isn't actually something new. So we've been using tissues from pigs for decades now uh, to support children who need to have heart surgery, as well as adults. Uh, although this uh, xenotransplantation is certainly very exciting, uh, this also isn't the first time this has been attempted. So there are certainly studies dating back to the 1960s of trying to implant uh, animal tissues or organs into people with varying levels of success. It's uh, it, it would I mean, I've tried to walk a mile in, in the recipient's shoes. How can you possibly uh, I don't know how you wrap your mind around what that experience must look like uh, for starters, being willing uh, to try something uh, with obviously significant consequences. If it works amazing, if it doesn't work, it's lights out 57 years of age. It obviously says something with regards to where he was at with regards to his prognosis otherwise. But but when you take a look at that, at the, the mindset somebody's got to be in to put to raise their hand and say, I'm willing to do this. Let's try this out on me. I mean, what insights, doctors, might you have into what this recipient must have been going through and, and, and maybe the, the, the decision that he would have made to volunteer for this? Dr. West, why don't you take it first? Well, you know, heart transplantation in particular presents us some very compelling situations. It's not that you can say, I'll just wait on dialysis like you could for a kidney transplant on dialysis for many years. Uh, really, this is a very compelling patient population for whom the alternative is death uh, if they're not able to obtain an organ. And I think that presents us, uh, as with lung and liver transplants, these life you know, in sustaining, not just sustaining, but life saving organs um, presents us with a very compelling population. And we face this not infrequently. It may not be that we have the option of a xenotransplant that we're offering to our patients, but their alternatives are very, very limited, if none, if they, if they're, if, you know, if we can't offer them some you know, some uh, a procedure like a transplant, like a heart transplant. This certainly does offer an additional risk because it's the first one uh, of this particular kind. And we could get into that a little bit if you like. Um, but uh, as far as what our patients face and how we offer options to them based on their alternatives um, is almost always compelling in transplantation. Well, yeah, and I would like to circle back on that, Dr. West, in just a second. But but Dr. Van Manen, how much of a game changer is this, do you believe? I mean, with, with regards to you, you've got somebody, um, I would imagine that you've got hundreds, if not thousands of people in North America and around the world that right now would would sign up for transplant surgery. I mean, they'd go right now. They've maybe got a bag packed sitting at the door waiting to go. I mean, it's a matter of life and death for them, but the organ availability simply isn't there 
When you talk about the application of animal organs, in particular, the organs of pigs genetically modified to have a better chance to actually translate into a human body. I mean, how big of a deal is it? I think it is a really big deal because, like you said, there is a human need for these organs. Um, and for many people, it is a game changer being able to have a heart and no longer be dependent on, you know, critical care technologies or otherwise live with certain limitations imposed by a failing organ. Just as you say it's compelling, though, we do have to take it from the perspective of what it's like for an individual who's faced with this as an option. Um, like you said, this is a life-saving uh, opportunity for this individual. And one does need to wonder to what extent do they really have a feeling of free choice to take or not to take this organ, knowing that it may be their only chance at life or getting out of an intensive care unit? And that's one way of looking at health ethics around this situation by asking the question of to what extent did we ensure that we respected the autonomy of this patient, meaning appropriately educate them of the risks, let them know what they were getting themselves into, recognizing the benefit is potentially huge, a chance at life, but there are also potential certain harms that this individual may live. Well, let's get it. Can we get into that? I mean, we want to talk about the science of it and we can bounce back and forth. I mean, it's not the first time that conversations uh, about medicine would have the science and the ethics of, uh, you know, of d development here and of research colliding with one another. But but Michael, what would you what would you assess to be the most significant ethical elements to this conversation? I think the ethical elements are, are different depending on what lens you take to the situation. Mm. Uh, if you take the lens of a, a health ethics perspective and really asking the question of, you know, what is it like for this individual, as well as the caregivers who are navigating, bringing in an innovative technology, then there are all kinds of ethical issues around consent, uh, beneficence, uh, potentially non-maleficence. So we're talking about benefits and harms here. Uh, and then there also are broader issues of justice, right? Because this is a huge investment, this form of research, uh, recognizing that there are other individuals who live with other health issues uh, that may not be as expensive to address, but we aren't necessarily addressing them, right, on, on a global scale when we talk about global ethics. But there are also other lenses that we could take to this situation as well. So we could look at it from a perspective of animal ethics as well, right? We're talking about using tissues from another live, live being uh, it's not a human being, uh, but nonetheless, to, to save a life. And clearly, the animals who are the subjects of this research uh, aren't donating their organs in the sense of having any free choice, right? They're being used as a means to an end. Their organs are being harvested for, for human gain. Yeah, and then there I are was... other ethics as well. Sorry to sorry, sorry, go ahead, doctor. I stepped on your toes there. I want to allow you to finish your thought, please. No, I think uh, I'll start there. OK, because I, I was uh, and I wasn't trying to be silly, but earlier this week I was saying, you know, if this was a Disney movie uh, and the animals could talk, uh, the pigs would certainly be having an emergency town hall right now. Right. And they'd, they'd be talking about the fact that organs are being harvested. And this is a good news story for the humans, but this is not a good news story for the pigs. But to be serious for a second. I mean, pigs are sentient beings. And, and Laurie, I would imagine that this is something that's probably crossed your mind as well in processing this. Now, I'm not going to come across as, as, as lying to you about my positions on anything. I mean, just yesterday, uh, you know, I made my son a beautiful sausage and egg brunch. I mean, we certainly eat these animals. Many of us do. And I'm not going to pretend like I don't think that organ transplantation is more of a noble calling than what we're eating for breakfast. So I think that a lot of people would say if it can save human lives, I'm all for it. But not everybody would agree. How, how do you reconcile the ethics of this? Who, me, uh, are you asking me? Yeah, please, Laurie. Yeah. yeah. OK, I, I, uh, I'll just say, first of all, that I mean, it's early days yet. We're only a few days out from this transplant. And so we will be all of us anxiously awaiting the continued clinical news on the progression of this case. But this has the potential to be undoubtedly a huge game changer um, in terms of what can be offered to humans who are suffering, millions of humans around the world who are suffering from end stage organ failure for which there is no other option than organ replacement. This is a, this, you know, if we can, um, if, if this, and, and it's a celebration of science. The science of the immunology of this kind of xenotransplantation has been uh, this 
case is built on decades and decades and decades of understanding the minute pathways by which this particular kind of organ donor, this kind, this particular species of organ donor could work in humans. And it's different from the baby Fay case because it's not a baboon. And so the immunology is a little different. It's different in terms of physiology um, from, uh, from other potential animals. Um, as you bring, you know, if we focus on the the ethics of using animals, I think it's so outweighed by the potential benefit to humankind, especially in an animal that is routinely used for food. So I, I you know, and that that changes a little bit the animal ethics, I believe anyway, from the many years of, of, of ethical debates about using non-human primates as potential organ donors for xenotransplantation, such as baboons and so on. But this case, it, you know, us hoping that it proceeds and continues to proceed as we've seen in these first few days is truly a game changer. When we talk about the numbers of patients who are listed for transplants of any kind, now those are only the lucky ones who actually get assessed and listed. There are millions of people around the world who could benefit from this therapy if it really um, turns out to be as successful as these early days look. And again, it's built on decades of meticulous science. Could one of you, uh, I'm sure both of you can, uh, help us understand what it is about the pig's anatomy or the anatomy of a pig's heart that makes it especially well suited for human application? Is there something about the pig's heart that would elevate it, it, it with regards to how appropriate it is over, for example, a baboon's heart? Maybe I can take that on because um, I've worked in this area for a long time. Um, well, there's size, for example. There are physiologic factors about um, you know, the way the heart functions or the liver or the kidney um, that are different from animal to animal. The pig has, has often been put forward as a, 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 a potential, a real potential, because um, it's, it's, um, it's not as difficult to breed pigs as it is to breed um, primates, non-human primates. There are multitudes of ethical concerns about using non-human primates for this kind of potential uh, work. The, the physiology of the pig heart, the anatomy of the pig heart is very similar to that of humans. Um, it's the size. Initially, it was thought it was the size in particular that would be the most difficult. But with these new gene edited pigs, where certain things have been uh, brought in and brought out, uh, so eliminated and introduced, um, the growth feature of it has uh, seems to have been taken care of by addressing, um, by limiting by a gene editing technique that limits the growth of these pigs. And so they're smaller in size. And so they fit more along the range of what we would, could expect would be suitable for a human. This is a, an interesting uh, point from Tracy, who's watching us live. She says on our YouTube chat, as the daughter of a farmer, uh, I learned early on that many animals are simply raised for human consumption. And it's a, a complicated ethical issue. And, and oftentimes choosing the lucky recipient uh, for an organ can be equally as difficult. Uh, we've got questions about people asking uh, about personal ethics of people with regards to receiving animal organs and how they might wrap their minds around that, which is pretty interesting. And then some random guy, that's the actual handle, wonders at some point, might we be able to grow live organs in a lab? And perhaps this may address the animal ethics side. Are either of you keeping an eye on that? Is, something that, is that something you can see that might be realistic? Uh, again, I could perhaps start um, because my laboratory work um, works in some of these areas. Um, the idea of uh, growing organs in labs is certainly out there. It's an active area of research, um, how one might do that or how one might take, for example, a heart, a human heart, and take all the cells out of the structure of the heart, leaving behind a sort of a skeleton, if you like, and repopulating that heart with with cells of the recipient, uh, which might which might then uh, alleviate some of the immunologic concerns. I mean, there are all kinds wherever the imagination can go in science, which is pretty much everywhere. Um, the idea that sustaining human life by exchanging an organ that's failing, but in a person who's otherwise pretty well, has been out there and is currently being explored. 
This is uh, a great point here, and I'm grateful to see Ashley introduce it into our chat. She says, transplants are the exact reason that I signed my donor card as soon as I was able to. I've had the conversation with my family. Should anything happen, donate everything you can uh, to transplant availability and, and the rest of it to science. Uh, Michael, with regards to your assessment of where the public is at, uh, awareness of, of, of transplantation needs and the science around it and the research of it, obviously people are hyper aware of these types of things, if it impacts them personally. But with regards to the general public, if you got the ear of thousands of people right now, what would you like people to consider? I, I mean, I, I do think that the act of organ donation is an ethical act, right? Because when we donate our organs, organs or our tissues for someone else, we're ultimately regarding the well-being of someone else as, as something of worthy. So for individuals who are willing or prepared to donate their organs or tissues in the situation where that would become an option, that, that is an ethical act. And I really think that we ought to support it. There is broad societal uh, acceptance for organ donation, but a minority of people do sign their donor cards. So if it's something you're prepared to do, then, then really I think it's something you should give a thought and have discussions with your loved ones. Um, I, I do think animal ethics is one lens that one can look at this situation from, but there are other lenses as well that need to be looked at as well. Uh, and one of the, the things I think that I found really interesting on reading the article um, is that this, this research was conducted outside of a trial. And I think that is of significance uh, because generally when we engage in research and clinical trials, there's a great deal of oversight. And this was rather done in a situation of responding to an individual's need. And we do need to wonder not only about individual risks, but also of societal risks. Uh, so just to give you an example, um, when we're talking about you know, genetically modifying an animal to use its organs and introducing those organs into to humans, is there a possibility that other things will be introduced as well? So, for example, the, the possibility of introducing, you know, viruses from a, a pig or other animal population now into humans that pose risks to them and, and seeing viruses spread throughout our, our population. This is something we're unfortunately quite familiar with, right, in the last two years. Uh, so there are also societal risks that, that also need to be considered in taking an ethics lens to xenotransplantation. I've not heard anybody bring that up, and that is a great point. Um, I, I want to sort of piggyback on the, uh, that's no pun intended. Uh, <laughs> I don't, sometimes you just walk right into them, you know, but but Dr. Van Manen, do you have, I mean, with regards to the ethics, and I'd be curious to pick both your brains on this, but Michael, you first. Uh, a lot of people have talked about, uh, and some jurisdictions are, are are flirting with it or even implementing it, an opt-out policy as opposed to opt-in when it comes to organ donation. Now, I've seen a lot of people cry foul with regards to their religious convictions. A lot of people believe that it's a step in the wrong direction. Others will say, hey, listen, this is an easy way for us to immediately bump up the availability of some of these organs, let alone you know, uh, tissue for skin transplants and, and what have you. Do you have a position on that or do you have a, a strong opinion on opt out versus opt in when it comes to organ donation? I think for to take an opt um, an opt out approach, there would have to be widespread societal acceptance of such an approach, and there'd have to be engagement on the societal level to discuss whether that's something that we would want to pursue. In certain societies, which are quite individualistic, whereby uh, individual liberty is placed in the forefront compared to societal good, that may not be an acceptable alternative. Do you have an opinion on that, Lori? Dr. West? I think we may have uh, lost Dr. West. It looks like the screen may be frozen. At, at least it froze in a flattering photo, which is great. Dr. West, can you hear me? Uh, we've got you back now. It looks like we may be froze just for a second. Uh, do you have an opinion on, on opt-out versus opt-in? Yeah, let me just, um, if I could, Ryan, um, just acknowledging um, Michael's previous point um, about the the potential for the spread of, of viruses from pigs, for example, that that concern has been undertaken very seriously by the 
xenotransplant community. And indeed, that concern alone almost halted completely all work on xenotransplantation from, from pigs due to the, to the risk of the porcine uh, uh, retroviruses, endogenous res retroviruses. So a lot of attention is being paid to that and um, has been over the last 15 years or so. With regard to opt out, I, I would just like to say that the consent, it's well regarded now, well, well understood now that the consent alone piece of the organ donation process is merely one aspect. And really the, in the countries that have the very highest performance in organ donation, such as Spain and uh, Slovenia uh, and other places, it's really the systematic look at all the pieces of the organ donation puzzle, in addition to the, 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 the consent model in the legal system of that jurisdiction. You may know that Nova Scotia has recently, very recently, um, uh, passed legislation for opt out as a consent process, but we're, we're beginning to understand as this has rolled out in Nova Scotia, is that it's all the other pieces of the system of organ donation in that jurisdiction that really matter. The education piece, the agency that, that, that uh, covers it, how well it's organized, especially the issues of mandatory referral and the training of the proper training of people to engage in the in the in the, the speaking to families and to potential donors themselves the, the 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 fine training of those in England they're called snods which is a specialist nurse in organ donation and those those kinds of programs have been hugely successful so i think it's probably a mistake to focus on one thing like the consent whether it's presumed consent whether it's opt in or opt out and rather making sure that we understand that the the entire process is what we need to focus on and that's got a special uh, you know, especially important here in Alberta, where our organ donation rates are amongst the lowest in the nation. Why do you think that is? I think it's because we haven't done those things uh, systematically. But I mean, you don't think it's like, do you think it's an ideological bend or do you think it's, it's no? I, I think not. I mean, as Michael said, when you, when you, when you actually talk to people about their, you know, on a, on a, on a, on a high level about their, their feelings about the altruistic act of organ donation, it's widely supported in almost every jurisdiction, including across Canada. But the nuts and bolts of it, if you don't make it easy and you put in place the actual systematically system elements that allow it to happen, allow it to happen smoothly, easily, um, allowing for the impact of proper end of life care for people who desperately want to participate in organ donation, then it just doesn't work very well. Before I thank you for your time, doctors, I'm, I'm curious to know, off, I mean, with a conversation like this, that is the magnitude of what we're talking about is so great. I mean, the technological, the medical, the scientific advancements here, the ethical side of it, the societal application, the fact that it is quite literally a matter of life and death. We're bound to miss wide swaths of conversation that, of course, are relevant and important. So I'd be curious to ask both of you in closing what we've missed what we've not touched on, what's an angle or an element of this story that you think demands the public's focus and probably some sober thought and, and consideration. Uh, Dr. Van Manen, maybe we'll come to you first. What have we not talked about today that you think is very relevant to this conversation? Um, I think this story needs our sustained public attention. So we need to follow this story as it moves outward to see what happens to this individual, as well as other individuals within this, this person's social network. Uh, one thing we haven't touched on, which isn't clear to me, is how uh, this individual receiving a, a xenotransplant uh, potentially will impact on the lives of others uh, in uh, his community. For example, our um, you know, family or friends are going to need special monitoring because they're going to be exposed to this individual who's carrying a genetically modified heart uh, from a from an animal because they are somehow seen at increased risk of infections, for example. We need to look at this individual's quality of life over time, right? Uh, we need to ask and look back at what processes were followed and what processes could have been improved upon for the oversight of this case. Mm. I and didn't, then the uh, last thing I would I would just say real quick is we also have to remember that we are not just using a pig's heart. We are genetically modifying another species in, in order to utilize it as a means. And one can begin to ask the question, uh, 
you know, how much genetic modification is okay? And what do we need to worry about if we modify other creatures uh, to be more like us, and yet we continue to treat them differently from us? That's a big one. That's a really big one. I appreciate that. That's the exact reason we have conversations like this. Dr. West, what did we miss? Um, I think, I think this, uh, I think we need to, uh, this is, this has brings in many, many complicated elements of science and ethics and medicine. Um, I think one of the things that we really need to pay attention to as the days unfold is, uh, is, is really how do we ensure accurate communication of science and not misinformation of science? We've seen this explode in the current pandemic, and I have no doubt we'll be seeing some elements of that as we follow this situation. And I think that the rigor of the science uh, must be understood. Um, if people want to read about these things, they need to go to the source and not to not to to the scientific source to get an accurate understanding of it. They need to really try and understand as with any other area of science that it's complicated, that experts have been doing this for many, many years. And um, we need to really pay attention to the rigor of scientific communication and, and, and efforts to avoid miscommunication um, really carefully. And this case is a good example, I think. I'm so grateful for both of your perspectives on this. This is, I don't want to treat this like a throwaway question, but it's, it's been surfacing a uh, number of people have asked it in our live chat. I'm just curious for both of your takes on this. And it, it is a serious question. Can, can you foresee, or have you even maybe seen evidence in past, even with, with like a pig's heart valve or a part of a, of an animal organ, um, uh, someone with a religious conviction or uh, even someone who may live a vegan lifestyle. Can you see somebody refusing an opportunity for an animal organ transplant, either of you? Uh, well, you know, it's remarkable how things shift when your choice is death. Yeah. I mean, really, it's remarkable how many people become, who, who may not have been huge proponents of organ donation, suddenly desperately hope for organ donation when their child needs a heart or when they need a heart. I, I mean, these things, you know, and, and religious convictions are, are very, very, it, this is very tricky conversations here. But when you're the one who is faced with this need or your loved one is faced with this need, these things can often change. I'm sure there will be someone who says, I just can't take an organ from a pig one day. And then their options will be different. And that's what, okay. But yeah, that's totally. I mean, it's a personal choice, like you said, right? Michael, what do you think? I, I'm really interested to hear the, the comments and commentary from different religious communities in response to this event. And I think that's something we should follow. Uh, I do think, like Laurie said, things change when you're talking about your life and things change when you're talking about your child. Uh, an interesting situation that we could get into in the future would be, uh, would parents be able to refuse on religious grounds uh, an organ from a, a pig or some other animal for their child on religious grounds if it has the benefit of saving them? Well, we uh, have parents often, uh, right now refusing blood transfusions for their children based on religious grounds. And and it's been noted, it's been documented that children have paid for that decision with their life. I mean, we've seen it, Right. Uh, generally, in situations where where parents on on the grounds of being Jehovah's Witness or, or, or another uh, faith or belief refuse uh, a medical intervention that's life saving, the, the courts would intervene and support the initiation of that treatment mm. uh, when we're dealing with children. Uh, now, this, of course, is quite a, an extraordinary example of you know, transplantation. So we'll have to follow and see what that means. Such a great conversation. And, and I always get the feeling, and, and this is a good thing, not a bad thing. I, I get the feeling that I have more questions now than I did when we started talking, which just means that you've both put such great information on our radar and you've allowed us to better understand this story which was the assignment of this roundtable. That was our mandate, and we're grateful for it. Dr. Michael Van Manen is director of the John Dossiter Health Ethics Center, also an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Alberta as a clinical practice as well, neonatal perinatal medicine at the Stollery Children's Hospital. Dr. Lori West, a recently minted officer of the Order of Canada, is director of the Canadian Donation and Transplantation Research Program. She also heads up the Alberta Transplant Institute. My sincere gratitude to both of you. Thank you for doing this happy to continue the conversation anytime you got thank you it. again for having us
You bet. And thanks to all of the real talkers that participated in this as well. I, I did my best to, to pop in on the live chat and, and get to what a lot of you were saying. And, and many of you, I mean, there have been some tough stories here. I mean, a couple of you saying that you've had family members, loved ones that have not qualified or have not been eligible for organ transplant based on their health situations. And of course, that's a tough pill to swallow. Uh, we got a lot of people talking about the ethics of this using animal organs. I'm curious to know where our team is going to land on this. So I'm going to uh, pick Sarah and Sam's brain on this in, in just a second and yours as well. Maybe Maybe this is something where, you know, you're listening to this podcast. Maybe it's Saturday now or Sunday, or maybe you're into next week. I still want to know where you land on the ethics of this, on the scientific. I mean, the do you share a sense with me of, of Marvel around this? I mean, it's a phenomenally impressive story. I mean, it's an amazing story. Uh, what they've accomplished here. If I, if I'm this the recipient of this heart, I mean, I kind of I can't imagine. You know, you're 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 Dave uh, Bennett. You're 57 years old. I mean, you want to live for another 30, 35 years, right? This guy's not going. I'm 57. It's time to mail it in. This guy's this guy's got a lot of living left to do. So you know, in, in the absence of an appropriate organ, uh, a human heart, of course, I would imagine the majority of people would be open minded to receiving this type of innovative transplant, but at the same time, there's no guarantees. I mean, when, when they, when they put Dave Bennett under, uh, when, when the anesthesiologist came in there, or is it anesthesiologist? I think, I think I blew it the first time around, uh, when they came in there and when he put that mask on and started to breathe deeply to go to sleep, there were no guarantees that that guy was going to wake up, uh, let alone yesterday and today and tomorrow, I mean, he's still into one, as you might say. Uh, Sarah Hoyles, the editorial producer of this show, first of all, great job lining up that panel. Great roundtable conversation. Try to walk a mile in Dave Bennett's shoes. Uh, maybe that's a silly way to put it because Dave Bennett, there's no way Dave Bennett could walk a mile uh, with regards to where his heart was at and his heart disease. Um, you walk a mile in his shoes. And you're given essentially a death sentence from your physicians that say you're not going to make it much longer. But we think that we might be able to pull something off with a pig's heart. Where does your head go if it's you? Uh, sign me up. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, yeah. Let's, let's make it happen. I mean, I will feel for the pig. I will because that's just who I am. But I also um, with him, there was there were no other options. It was death. That was what was forthcoming for him. Yeah. Sam, are you the same? Sign you up? You go for it? Or is it more complicated than that? Uh, I, yeah, sign me up. Okay. Yeah, I don't I don't want it. I don't want this like everybody in agreement situation again. But it, it's just, you know, I, I <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I it went by whipping fast. So I can't remember who said it in the live chat, but somebody actually kind of made the point of there's sort of like, if I'm facing death, sign me up for everything that is experimental in the book. Like if my choice is participate in potentially a scientific breakthrough or die anyways, I'm yeah. taking the pig's heart every time. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I mean, I do find it fascinating and several people brought it up in the chat, which I appreciate some of the uh, things that may preclude someone from being willing to do this, whether it was somebody that was a vegan or whether it was somebody that maybe had religious uh, reasons for declining this 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 type of, of medical advancement or the opportunity for this medical advancement. And that's a personal decision. I mean, but but for me, uh, whether or not you're a vegan, the question is, do you want to die for it or do you want to go on living? Maybe someone will write into the show to talk at ryanjesperson.com and say, you, you are oversimplifying this, you moron. You can't simply just say, uh, you know, either die from it or move on and accept it. It's more complicated than that. If that's the case, I'd love to have you type out your thoughts. Take some time, put into it, and we'll get to some of your comments next week. Uh, Sarah, we talk about the relationship be between humans and other animals that are walking the face of this earth. And, and you've been keeping an eye on a pretty interesting story out of Spain. Now, it's not so much in the medical research line of things as much as it is uh, how the courts may decide things like custody of animals. Uh, in, for example, a scenario where, where there's a divorce, a relationship is breaking apart. What are the details here? Well, I just want to first flag that my dog, Ranger, might pipe up on this conversation. He He's, may have strong opinions. He on... may have strong opinions. You might hear him in the background. So just <laughs> FYI. Uh, basically what it is, is the it's from a divorce is where this came about for the law in Spain. They were looking at divorce 
how does custody work? And as you had mentioned earlier on, it was about property, that pets were property. Now they're saying, no, they are sentient beings. They, they deserve to be a part and be considered family members. So this is, this is big, which is also interesting because the Pope, the Pope oh, geez. was saying that, no, no, having pets, selfish. Yes, selfish if you're going to have pets and not kids. Yeah, that was that was last week, right? The Pope said that if you if you elect to have couples that elect to have kid or uh, have animals ahead of kids uh, are acting selfishly. I'm always and and I'll just leave my comments limited on this. I always think it's so I was like tell me tell me more you single virgin about your perspective on the validity of people's family setups. Like I just love having old single virgins from the Vatican tell everybody their hot takes on family dynamics. I don't even know why anybody listens anymore. Agreed. I just I thought it was like, well that's rich. Oh, yeah, and there's see, Ranger. Ranger there's, agrees. Ranger's yeah. a smart dog. I mean, what do you want me to do? Uh, but so, so in the case of separation and divorce, and I think for a lot of people, I mean, this is happening in Spain. It's a story you're keeping an eye on, but people in North America would know that the, 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 that pets are treated by law as property, right? They're treated like objects in so many ways as a snowblower or a trailer. Uh, your dog or your cat would be included as property, right, in these types of negotiations. So now it means, I guess, in Spain, you were saying that pets can no longer be seized, mortgaged, abandoned, mistreated, or removed from one of their owners, so bigger picture, implication-wise, it'll be interesting to see how this changes things like custody arrangements. It's something, of course, that people will be keeping an eye on. It's happening in Spain, but but could be here, right? Uh, absolutely. I think, I mean, it definitely, you know, raised my eyebrows and made me go, huh, I wonder what yeah. it's like in Canada and precisely that. Their property, it's like a snowblower. It's it's like a couch. Yeah. The, the idea of pets as family members uh, is, is nothing new. Um, I suspect, Sam, that that in your household, uh, if push were to come to shove, that uh, the pet as a family member would probably be prioritized, maybe even ahead of yourself when it came to comforts, when it came to a, a appropriate treatments. Uh, is there any doubt in your mind whether or not your beloved pop qualifies as a family member? You refer to her as a family of member. She's a I would family imagine. member. Sophie's yeah. a family member. Willie and Pixie, my childhood felines, were family members. Willie my sister, and Pixie. my sister's pop Camille was a family member. Um, they are all like they've they've Im like these animals have imprinted on my life. They have become oh yeah a part of who I am. There's no denying that they are part of my family. Yeah, people. I mean, Sarah and I, you, you, you and I were talking yesterday. A bit of strategy. Uh, people might be surprised here. We actually do have strategy sessions ahead of the show. But we thought, well, maybe we should do a Twitter poll on whether or not people consider their pets to be family. And then we both agree it's going to be a hundred percent yes. You know, I mean, except for maybe maybe some of my relatives, uh, and I won't name them by name, Graham, but some of my relatives <laughs> that are on farms would probably point out that you can't always view the farm dogs and cats as family members because it makes things complicated. Uh, a lot of times people in agricultural applications have to see the animals just a little bit differently. They're, they're, they're working animals in many circumstances, but I think if you're living especially within the city limits, and, and I would say writ large, the bigger picture, most people are going to agree, obviously, pet or family members in some circumstances receiving more privileges than some of the human beings under the same roof. But what's been really interesting is in our live chat, Kaylin was mentioning, you know, it's interesting that we were just talking about organ donation and organs from animals. And yeah. in this legislation in Spain, it said that this applies to all animals, whether they're domesticated or wild. Yeah. So this is really like there's a lot of gray area because we're talking about organ donation, animals, pigs, and then we're saying, oh, no, they're sentient beings. They are family members. Yeah, this is complicated, complicated stuff. Good thing we got real talk here to take on all of these big questions and big issues. And of course, we do it along with you uh, listening at home or on the go. We so appreciate your contributions. I know it's not lost on you that as we're having these chats within our team, and then of course, we're talking, uh, you know, having these interviews every single weekday morning as well, that your comments to us, your emails, your tweets, your live chat contributions are all such a big part of this. And we so appreciate the role that you real talkers play in driving these conversations. 
Uh, I wanted to remind you, if if you're watching us on YouTube right now, you can see that I'm rocking my Real Talk Ryan Jesperson t-shirt. Wanted to let you know that you can pick up this t-shirt. I got somebody sending me a direct message on Twitter asking, where do I get a Real Talk t-shirt? You go to our website, ryanjesperson.com. You click on merch, and that's where you can find these t-shirts. You can find these uh, Real Talk Crescent mugs. You see us using these in studio and here at my home studio as well. Of course, Real Talk golf balls and vinyl stickers and snapback caps and uh Hoyles, I don't even know if I told you this. Did I tell you already? We haven't had a chance to photograph them yet, but we've got our ladies tees in now. We had so we had, fitted we, ones. Yeah, the fitted tees. We had mm-hmm. we had some of our friends chiming in saying, "You guys got these like big boxy T-shirts for dudes. When are you going to get us fitted T-shirts?" And so we've got them. And we're I mean, get them I enjoy a good site. boxy T-shirt. I enjoy a oh, good yeah. boxy T-shirt when you know I want to wear PJs or I'm doing some yard work. But sometimes I like. I like to be have a little more fitted tea. Two years into the pandemic, all I'm rocking is boxy t-shirts right now, my friend. The fitted t-shirts are all in a pile at the back of the closet, and I will revisit those at a future date. So you can go online to our website, ridejesperson.com. That's where you can find our Real Talk merch. Shipping is always free. And while you're there, click on Connect. And I want to invite each of you to participate in our question of the week this week. It's presented by our research and strategy partners at Wise Station. We're asking you. It's a fun one. It'll take you two minutes to look into your crystal ball and tell us what 2022 looks like to you. What do you think will be the big news stories? Where does the pandemic wind up by the end of the calendar year? Who's winning the Stanley Cup? You can let us know what you think. And of course, we'll review the results of that question of the week early next week. Our friends at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park want me to remind you that this weekend and through the rest of the month of January, They've got their take-home Dairy Queen treats like the wildly popular DQ ice cream sandwiches and, of course, the OG, the Dilly Bar, up on special right now. It means when you buy one box of Dilly Bars or DQ sandwiches, you're going to take another one home free. Now, it may vary the exact specifics of the deal location to location, but all you need to know is you go through the drive through window or you head up to the till and you drop our name, Real Talk. Ryan Jesperson, you're going to buy one, get one free when it comes to Dilly Bars and DQ ice cream sandwiches. And if you're there and you're doing the blizzard thing, you're holding it upside down and you're about to hammer down, we want to see your photos on Instagram, on Twitter. Make sure you tag us at Real Talk RJ. Our friends at Friesen Brothers know that, of course, family brunch is a big deal for a lot of you this weekend. And a big part of family brunch is in our house are the fresh and gooey cinnamon buns made famous by the bakers, the real bakers at Friesen Brothers. They're perfect for weekend brunch or any time. And you can find those world famous fresh and gooey cinnamon buns, those sourdough cinnamon buns. Oh my gosh, if I start talking and thinking about them, I'll never stop at the 16 Friesen Brothers locations across the province. Friesen Brothers for more than 65 years has been Alberta grown and Alberta owned. And our friends at Local Environmental Services want to remind you that they are in business and always expanding across the prairies, Alberta and Saskatchewan. As a matter of fact, they made a big announcement just the other day. I think it was White Court in the most recent announcement. You're going to see more and more of those big green trucks, the big green bins as well. It's all part of what they do when it comes to construction, commercial, and industrial waste and recycling management. They love to compete for your business. They'll give you a better deal than what you're getting with your current provider, I guarantee it. You can find them online right now at localwaste.ca. Now, every Friday, our friends at Local Environmental Services give us an opportunity to blow off a little steam, to get off our chest what we need to get off our chests. It's a tradition that we like to call the trash talk. Okay, so here's the deal. I'm doing this from home and you know that. So there's a six-year-old that's learning all kinds of new words on the playground and at hockey practice. And the last thing he needs is to expand the uh, colorful side of his vocabulary here. So I'm going to keep my voice down. And thanks to those of you that submitted Wyatt-friendly trash talk emails this week, like this one from Brinley, who says, Jespo, I can respect you're going to be reading these emails with your little guy just off camera or maybe somewhere else in the house. So I'll do my freaking best to watch my mouth. Brinley 
says, Dag Nabbit, I've had enough with this pandemic and everything that goes along with it. I'm so twisted up. I don't even know what to think anymore. My friends are down in Cabo right now, which makes me happy and mad at the same time. I feel like they're betraying what we're trying to do, and they're also doing what I want to do. I see friends of mine going out for dinners right now, and I want to go for dinner, and I see friends out and about, and I want to be out and about. Cripes! It's like everybody's done with taking all these measures, but our case counts are the highest they've ever been. Get vaccinated? Check. Get boosted? Check. Wear a mask everywhere and social distance? Check. But still, what's even changed? What sort of a frickin' Groundhog Day type nightmare is this? Now, I'm not some sort of fuddy-duddy, but I wish we could all just do whatever, and I mean whatever it takes to get through this all in a few weeks. Whatever it takes, sign me up. Other places seem to be able to do it. Why not us? That from Brinley. Nice family-friendly trash talk there, Brinley. I appreciate it. How about this one from T? T says, seriously, how hard is it to just be nice? My son works at a local improvement center. Not a single shift goes by that he doesn't have to deal with multiple unmasked customers. Why isn't the store doing more to enforce the mask mandate? It's a public health emergency. This organization seems to be catering to its lowest end. If these brain-dead, brainwashed losers want to flounce through life unmasked during the fastest spreading virus in human history, then let's let these Darwin Award winners get what's coming to them. I mean, why is it every single one of them with their tiny PP energy? I know why it's going to repeat that one. Why do they get off on harassing minimum wage staff even when they're not being challenged about masking, yet still making this an issue? Now, I'm not a doctor, but here's a little medical advice says T. If your cojones are that small, there's nothing at a big box home improvement store that can help you with that. Bullying minimum wage workers, proving yourself to be ignorant and selfish makes you a world class anal poor. T. And she's into the big box that's doing very little proactive work to enforce the mask mandate. You suck too. That from T. What about this one from Tanya? It says, you know what? I want to check in on people that are just blaming the unvaccinated for strains on our healthcare system. You're missing an important point, says Tanya. Terrible government policy and messaging is letting the virus run wild. Governments absolutely have choices between lockdown and nothing that could reduce transmission and keep people from infecting each other. Where's the paid sick leave? Where's the better quality mask mandates? Where's the better rapid test distribution? Where's improved vaccine access through pop-up clinics? And where's the financial support for people needing to isolate and businesses that employ them? By making the unvaccinated the scapegoats, we take the pressure off government. Now, we're all bloody tired and looking for solutions out of this mess, but they are not, and these solutions are not, only tied to the vaccine status of the general population we need to be more honest with ourselves that from tanya i appreciate this one from devin who wrote in to say i'm getting real tired of everybody just telling everyone to stay safe and leaving it at that it's been two years says devin frick off well thanks very much devin and how about this one as well we've got trash talks coming in from james who says this pecking variant Nice one, James. Is going to get us all in the gluteus maximus eventually. Nice one, James. He says, now I've been careful, but I work in a high exposure job, and so it was inevitable. But the continued stubbornness of deniers drives me up the drywall. Simple measures would knock this down faster than Mike Tyson knocked down Marvis Frazier. I had to Google it. But no, everybody thinks that they're Evander Holyfield when in fact you're just Evander Holyfield's ear. James? Nice play. Now, I have to congratulate everybody for your Wyatt Friendly Trash Talk submission. Thanks very much today. This marks the first Trash Talk ever where every single submission we read was along the lines of one theme. We want to reflect where you're at, Real Talkers. If there's something else grinding your gears that you're not hearing about on the show, we want to know what it is. You can get in touch with us anytime. Talk at RyanJesperson.com. Coming up next week on the show, we're going to check in with a couple of doctors on Monday who take issue with what they heard on this show this week. We said, all right, join us and let's talk it out. Plus, toxic positivity. What's that? People 
faking positivity. We see it all around us. How to identify it and what to do about it. Plus, the former CEO of the Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corporation. Why did Alicia Dubois leave the post after just 14 months? She'll tell us in an exclusive. That and more coming up next week on Real Talk. Have an amazing weekend, Real Talkers. Thanks for joining us from home or wherever this week. And we'll see you soon.